the Amityville Horror once again, and we will now be looking at the 2005 remake. As you can see here, we actually have a person being threatening. And this is basically representing the first movie. There is no personified source of threat. And that was one of the problems there. Anyway, the newlyweds George and Kathy Lutz move into a house that they pretty much know they might not be able to afford. In this one, at least, they kind of joke about it. And the real estate agent begrudgingly reveals to them what we've already seen, which is that Ronnie DeFeo, the eldest son, living there before in this house in Amityville, killed six of his relatives, including the four other children and both parents. He did this immediately after watching I don't know, I think it's like a, a signal test and it has an Indian in the very center of it. I don't know, maybe they had really weird programming back in the 70s. Maybe that's why they cancelled that show. It made people kill their families. Anyway, after this, they debate if they should still buy the house. And you probably already know what decision they come to, but just in case, they buy it! And they now begin to move in with the three children that are Kathy's. This is played up more in this. There is a bit of a rivalry going on between George and the eldest son, Timmy, Billy, Timmy Billy, Billy, and I would personally back off if I was George, because Billy is actually Tommy, the psycho kid from the butterfly effect, so I'd watch my ass around him. This conflict works well, it's it's psychologically credible, you know, the eldest son, he, he has the best, the most memories of his father, and he's kind of the man of the house now that the father is gone, so when this new man comes along, you know, it's that kind of alpha male thing, he has to be sure that this new guy is cool enough if he can take it, and, and at the same time, what George is in this. Maybe he was supposed to be in the first one, but it's much more pronounced here. He comes from a sort of disciplined background, and he wants to make a man out of Billy. The characters are just far more developed here. I guess the one I knew the least about, of the leads at least, was probably the younger son, and I still had a basic idea of what he was like, other than the fact that he has a really creepy face. The daughter is played by Chloe Moretz of Kick-Ass fame. Now, I only actually ever watched the trailer for that movie, and it put me off completely, but honestly, as far as I can tell, Kickassia actually kicks a lot more ass than kick ass, but I don't know. She was a pretty decent actress back then, also. Reynolds gets to be funny, which is his best talent, at least as far as what he does on screen. I don't know, maybe off screen he's, you know, one heck of a banjo player, I don't know. 
and this really helps because admittedly the film is kind of the typical new horror film I would say it gets part of that from the fact that it's Michael Bay who helped produce this especially the first 15 minutes or so are hideously over stylized I mean as we see Ronnie go around killing his siblings I think if you count the lightning flashes you may have to j just round it off to the nearest hundred or you know nobody's gonna care about the actual number it's pretty ridiculous I don't know if they just found out that strobe lights exist or something but it was excessive at other points in the movie the editing also is fortunate as it's especially first 15 maybe first 30 minutes or so and this is much more straightforward we see the ghosts we get a lot of exposition and it's pretty clear as well and we find out things before we necessarily need to know them this is one of those Hollywood movies where they're really terrified that you know the moment you know those gray cells start pumping that you know most of the theater will vacate but it is still relatively entertaining. It's not a good movie, but it more or less delivers what it promises, which isn't much. Reynolds is funny. The acting is good for pretty much everyone involved. It's only 78 minutes, so you're really not losing very much. I would also say it's worth noting that this is a sort of reunion of alias hot chicks that weren't Sydney but were kind of you know maybe competing with her or you know on the same not quite same level as her but you know Melissa George as Kathy Lutz and Rachel remember her real last name so I'm just gonna go with Gibson as a babysitter and I wouldn't mind being babysat by her and Melissa is friggin hot too this completely eliminates the partner and the psychic and we don't miss them in the least the priest's role is minimized. The evil eyes windows are downplayed. They no longer have the red tint behind them, which I don't know. I mean, if you just approach the house at night, I mean, we're okay. Maybe you don't go out at now night much, and maybe if you did, you wouldn't necessarily look back towards the house. But at some point. If they were in front of the house, they would have to turn back, and they would see, oh, hey, the front of our house looks like an evil, smiling face. Maybe that's a bad omen. The effects are largely pretty good. Granted, there's maybe more CGI than there really needs to be. This doesn't build an atmosphere. All the scares are very, you know, the situation starts, it lasts for couple of minutes and then it ends you know they're very swift and there are jump scares that aren't necessarily all that good I've
been told that this does not stay close to the supposed actual haunting, nor the book. And that might be true. I honestly like this a lot better than the first one. Yes, it's cheap and really straightforward, but at least it did have, you know, basically what it should. I mean, not all old horror movies are necessarily good, and, you know, the original Amityville Horror certainly wasn't, in my opinion. But most new horror movies are certainly crap, and this isn't the worst of them. As long as you can tolerate that it's one of the new ones. It gets the job done. I mean, it's like fast food. You don't necessarily expect much. You start eating and you start bitching about the flavor and you know it's just full of stuff that isn't good for you and, you know, you're bitching but you still finish eating and you go out and soon after you want some real food but it still basically gets the job done, you know. The filming and the editing when it doesn't go, you know, freaking out MTV style, are quite good. The director comes from a photography background, and you can tell. This does use some of the ominous angles that the first did. On the whole, it's just, I mean, both are sometimes at least photographed well. This is better photographed, and it really doesn't use as many gimmicks as the first one. Reynolds losing his mind and becoming a serious threat to his family works. I mean, it is partially reminiscent of Nicholson's performance in The Shining. I'm not gonna equate the two performances because it's not quite that, but it is quite good. Reynolds can be terrifying. If you don't think so, you have to see this movie. Trust me. And it really helps that there is no back and forth. There is no changing back and forth. Once he starts to turn, it's just a downward spiral. It just gets worse and worse. You cannot see any end in sight. I mean, it's not like everything he does is destructive, but every time he opens his mouth, and every time that he really does something that isn't just the immediate natural response to that situation, it's, you know, letting us know he's moving nicely along down that path. I suppose that's more or less what there is to say about the movie without getting into spoilers. So, I will cut it off here and then proceed to stop the bleeding. That was my spoiler for review of The Amityville Horror from 2005. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.